if you operate, you're going to have complications, and we all know that. And so Mo asked if I'd put a talk together on managing complications that follow penile implant surgery, and I'm, and I'm certainly happy, to, I was very happy to do it, and I'm happy to be here given the talk. And I wanted to, to touch on just a few things that can happen, some more common things that we have to manage. And device infection is one of the things we all think about when we're performing prosthetic urology. Now, device infection is not very common, okay? It's a low percentage of individuals who have a penile implant who will get an infection, but the, compli or but, the, but the implications of device infection are significant. And like I said, infection rates are low, and depending upon the literature you look at for non-diabetic patients, you know, again, depending on the series, a half a percent up to two percent. So it's not very common. A little more common in diabetics. The diabetic patient has a, has a higher propensity to have uh, infection after implant surgery. So the, so the, the, the occurrences aren't frequent, but when they happen, it's a real problem. And each company, each device company has their own infection preventing mechanism, if you will. On the left is the, is the AMS 700 device with inhibizone, and inhibizone, as we know, is a combination of rifampin and minocycline that's actually impregnated uh, onto the surface of the device, and that's been very, very effective in terms of helping prevent implant infection. On the right is the Coloplast device, the Titan, and the Titan in infection preventing mechanism is actually a hydrophilic coating, and so you uh, have antibiotics in an aqueous solution, and then you dip the implant into that, and the uh, hydrophilic coating on the implant causes the antibiotic solution to adhere to the surface, and that's the infection retardant mechanism. The nice thing about that, and I know Dr. Wilson can speak to this, the nice thing about the hydrophilic coating is that it does allow the surgeon to tailor the antibiotics you're using to what you, to what you think is the best. And so it may be at your institution, uh, you know, using a certain set of antibiotics are going to be best, whereas my institution's different. So you can tailor that. You can add in antifungals. So that's, that's a nice attribute of the hydrophilic coating. But that's how the companies have their devices set up for infection retardant mechanism. Now, what do you do if you have a device infection? So if you realize the implant is infection, there's no question that the, the approach that's going to work all the time, the most conservative approach, is to get all the components out of there. You've got to take everything out. Take out the cylinders, the pump, the reservoir, all tubing and such. Remove all the components. Wash out the implant spaces pretty aggressively. Allow healing and then return to fight another day. Now, we believe that returning to fight sooner is better than later because it allows less time for scarring and such. So four to six weeks. Come back and place another implant. And in this talk today, I'm talking primarily about the three-piece inflatable devices. So that will work. The patients will heal. You'll get them through the infection, but there are, but there are downsides to it. Inter intracorporal scarring is probably the biggest downside because you take the cylinders out, and as these gentlemen start to heal, they're going to get scarring in the corporal bodies, and the scarring is going to lead to a loss of length, going to lead to a loss of girth, and you're going to have an unhappy patient. Okay, So that's going to happen, or its potential can happen if you use this conservative approach. You can plan on the re-implant surgery being more difficult because you will have some scarring in the corporal bodies and it's going to be a tougher case. So you may need cavernotomes or devices to cut through that scar tissue. You may, you may need multiple corporotomies to get in the implant. So it's going to be a harder surgery and you have to be ready for that. Personally, I think that, that, that an individual who has gross purulence, gross pus, cellulitis of the scrotum or the, or the skin of the penis, fever, chills, and sepsis, this is the best way to handle them. Take everything out, wash it out, return to fight another day, okay? I think also in the diabetic, the uncontrolled diabetic, it's probably the best way to handle things. So that's the most conservative, conservative approach. There is something called salvage revision where we remove all of the components, wash out the implant spaces, and then place a new infection retardant device. Okay. In the case of that surgery, you'd take out the implant, and then you'd you take everything out, wash everything out, and then you reprep, you redrape, new gowns, new gloves, a second back table, a new instrument set, when you to put in the new implant. I think that's a pretty good option, honestly, in a patient who's not a diabetic, who's got that kind of low-grade smoldering infection where maybe the pump is fixed to the overlying skin of the scrotum, or there's tenderness that's lasted longer than you think, pain that's lasted longer. The pump is fixed. They don't have any active purulent drains and no cellulitis. I think salvage revision can be a good option. So salvage revision, certainly it can work. We remove all the components. Another type of salvage revision can be removing all of the components, okay? And then as opposed to putting a new three-piece in, you can use semi-rigid device as space savers. 
Because remember, we worry when you take an implant out that you're going to have scarring of the corporal bodies with a loss of size and such. But if you use a semi urgent device as a space saver, that, can that will prevent replacement of the corporal spaces with scarring. And so this can be a good strategy because a lot of times these infections are centered around the pump. So take everything out, wash everything out, reprep, redrape, and put a, and put a semi-rigid device in. And I will tell you that personally, I would only use a semi-rigid device with an infection retardant mechanism. And what I mean is not all semi-rigid devices have some kind of infection retardant strategy. In the coloplast device, the Genesis has that hydrophilic coating. Unfortunately, the Boston Scientific device, which is now mode, the most recent iteration is the Tactra, doesn't have any, doesn't have inhibizone, doesn't have a hydrophilic coating. So personally, I think if you're in an infection situation and you want to maintain that space, then I like the idea of using the semi-rigid device that has an infection retardant mechanism or infection retardant strategy behind it. Uh, if you use the semi-rigid uh, rods as a space saver in this salvage case, you put the semi-rigid rods in, and then the idea would be to return after healing has occurred and take out the semi-rigid rods, take out the semi-rigid prosthesis, and then replace a new three-piece device. Now, now, a lot of times, not an insignificant amount of time, patients will be pretty happy. In other words, you, you've taken out their three-piece, you've cured their infection, they've got the space savers, and they may be completely happy with, with the, with the semi-rigid implant. They may say, you know what, Brian, this is great, my infection's cured, I can have penetrative intimacy, I'm not going back to the operating room. But if they want to go back to the operating room, then you can certainly do that. And this, is, this has become my go-to now in the well-controlled diabetic who doesn't have purulent cellulitis and so forth. It's a good strategy to use. So device infection is certainly a post-op complication. I used to think that device infection was the most feared post-op complication in prosthetic urology uh, until I started to think about it and had personal experience with glands necrosis. Now, now I think that's the most feared complication of penile implant surgery because when a guy loses the head of his penis, it's a big deal. Now, it's almost always seen in a diabetic patient, particularly when aggressive reconstruction techniques are used, sliding or advancement techniques, where you're doing things like elevating the neurovascular bundle, you're, you're, you're moving the spongiosum and the urethra away from the corporal bodies, you're actually incising tunica albuginea because you're trying to increase length, that's the concept of the sliding maneuver. And you can do that, obviously, with a penile implant in place. These are the, these are the situations where you're most likely to see glands necrosis. So if a patient has glands necrosis, if you've done an implant and the patient comes in and you suspect that he's got necrosis or you're seeing necrotic tissue, you need to get the implant out. So that's how you handle that complication. If a man comes in, you've done his implant, and you're seeing dead corporal tissue or a dead glandular tissue, dying glandular tissue, get the implant out as soon as you can to try to prevent loss of the entire glands. Also, actually using nitro paste on the glands, some say helps to promote blood flow. So glands necrosis, obviously a major complication get the implant out. Scrotal hematoma. So this is one we've all, if you do prosthetic urology, you're going to have it. I think scrotal hematomas are probably more likely to occur if one does a scrotal approach versus an infrapubic approach. I don't know if there's hard data. It's just kind of my gestalt. But certainly you can have a scrotal hematoma with whatever approach you use. And here's the thing. I think the most important thing about managing a scrotal hematoma is the surgeon being willing to say, yep, there's a scrotal hematoma. You got to look at it, admit it, and say, okay, he's got a hematoma. I just got to get him back to the operating room and evacuate this thing. Because sometimes, and I've done this, I've done the experiment myself, and it doesn't work that well. You try to ride it out with the patient. You think, oh, you know what? Just get off your feet, take it easy, ride it out. You're going to be okay. And all that does is delays healing. The patients have more pain. They're unhappy. You can't cycle the device as early as you would like, which has implications. So if you got a scrotal hematoma, Take into the operating room, evacuate it, wash with antibiotics. You and the patient are going to be much happier in the long run. Like I said, I've done that experiment, and then this is what I think the best way to handle the problem is. So SST and hypermobility. So I, I think this is really important. It's getting certainly a lot more talk in, in prosthetic urology circles. Glands hypermobility and SST deformity are not the same thing. People can sometimes use those terms interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. And it's important to realize they're not the same thing because how we manage them is completely different. So SST deformity is resulting from an undersized implant. And SST deformity 
you folks probably all remember, most of you remember the whole, the super, the Concord, the supersonic transport plane, because the nose of the plane would tilt over when they were on the ground so they could see. And that's what we call SST deformity. The glands is kind of flopping over. So SST deformity is because of an undersized implant. Glands hypermobility is not. So in glands hypermobility, the implant is appropriately sized. The surgeon has placed the appropriate size implant. But in that particular individual, the glands is poorly supported by the anatomic limit of the corporal bodies. And so if you look at the pictures, what I'm talking about is this, is that you know men's anatomy. The corporal bodies certainly go into the glands, but some men, the corporal bodies will extend further into the glands, that's their particular anatomy, than other men. And we always like to think in our minds when we're doing penile implant surgery, we always think we're going to dilate until we can get these cylinders. Every cylinder's got to go fully into the mid glands. Uh, and that's where it needs to sit. Well, some men's anatomy, the, the corporal bodies don't go as far into the glands. And so when that happens, think about this. During a vascular normal erection, when a man has an erection, the corporal bodies fill with blood, separate blood supply to the spongiosum. So the glands fills with blood, the corporal bodies fill with blood, and everybody's happy because the glands is well supported. But in a penile implant erection, you pump up those cylinders, and of course the shaft is well supported and rigid, but the glands is not. Penile implant technology is such that we don't have a filling or a rigidity of the glands with our current uh, iterations of penile implants. So for the man whose corporal bodies don't go as far into the glands, they can have this hypermobile gland problem. It's not an undersizing. It's not a mistake by the surgeon. It's simply, it's simply a result of their particular anatomy. And it's important to realize that because it's tempting during implant surgery when you're dilating and you see that the dilator goes perhaps into the proximal glands, not the mid glands. It's really tempting to say, if I shove a little bit harder with this dilator, things are, I'm going to be able to get the implant out. And yeah, you can shove a little harder and you'll get the implant somewhere, but you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna rupture the tunic, you're going to have problems. And so some men, you just have to realize that's their limit. How do you treat? SST, the treatment of, of true SST and undersized implant is to take the implant out and put a properly sized implant in. So if a man has SST deformity because of an undersized implant, you remove the implant and you replace it with an appropriately sized cylinders. The treatment for the hypermobile glands would be glands pexy, which is what we're illustrating here. So again, the hypermobile glands, the man has the proper sized implant, but what you do is an incision, and here's, here's what it looks like. Here's the cylinder tips, you can see them. That's the anatomic limit of this man's corporal body, but because the glands is not is, is poorly supported, it tends to ride over. And so you make an incision on the dorsal side, and you basically reflect the glands off the corporal bodies, and that's what's been done here. And here's the tips of the, of the uh, cylinders, you can see them. They're in the tissue, obviously. So you make this incision, you dissect, reflect the glands, and then what you're going to do is you're going to deflate the cylinders and kind of milk them back because ultimately what you're going to do is pass a stitch through the capsule that is formed around the tip of the implant cylinder. So on each side, you're going to pass a permanent stitch and you're going to take a bite of that capsule and then you're going to anchor that stitch deep into the glandular tissue. And when you tie the stitches down, it anchors the glands onto the tips of the uh, corporal bodies. So again, an incision, reflect the glands, find the tips, or find the, the tips of the cylinders, deflate to milk them back, take a bite of that capsule, anchor that into the head of the, into the uh, glands deep tissue, and you tie it, you, you've anchored the hypermobile glands. And so hypermobility, that's how it's treated with a glands pexy. SST deformity, resize the implant. And that's important to realize that difference. Last, the last complication I was, gonna, I was gonna put up today, I thought about this reservoir herniation, and I've seen this a couple times in my practice. As I was putting the talk, as I was getting ready to think about the talk, I was like, man, maybe I'll include reservoir herniation, maybe I won't. But it hadn't happened that much. That is until last week when I had now my third case of reservoir herniation after an implant. And when I've seen this, the three times I've seen it, it is always the same story. It's an individual, you've put the reservoir through the ring, okay, into the space of Retzius. Uh, and then the night after surgery, the guy has a lot of vomiting and nausea, and I think because of basically... Uh, uh, they contract their abdominal musculature, they give big valsalva movements because they're throwing up, and, the, and then the reservoir squirts back through the inguinal ring and winds up in the scrotum or in, in the uh, inguinal region. So the three times I've seen that, that's exactly what's happened. 
And so how do you treat that? You take them back to the operating room. And I think the best way to fix it is what I've done. Again, not that my N is very high, just two, soon to be three. I made it, you make a lower quadrant incision, and you do make a small fasciotomy and get that reservoir below the fascia, below the muscle, and then close that fasciotomy, and that's going to keep the reservoir in place. So this isn't a very common thing to see, but since I had another one pop up recently, I thought I would throw it in here. So these are just some of the complications you can see after prosthetic urologic procedures, specifically penile implants. I think the most important thing is to recognize the complications, recognize them for what they are, take the appropriate steps to treat them. Don't just try to ride things out because typically it just doesn't work well. You need to identify the problem, admit the problem, talk to the patient, obviously, and, and, and take action and, and get them through it. Uh, again, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.